Now, the last couple of years, natural resources and commodity shares have really helped prop the market up. But, like me, in the last couple of months, I've got a bit of an unseasonal cold. Now, I know I'm going to feel better in a couple of days, but our commodity shares are going to feel better. Well, who better to ask than Graham Birch, who's manager of the aptly named BlackRock World Mining Trust. Let's see what he's got to say. You were one of the first people to uh, predict a commodity super cycle, probably way back in 2000, 2001. Uh, and investors in the BlackRock World Mining Trust have certainly benefited from your foresight um, over the last seven years or so. But there's been some weakness in commodities in general. Um, How has this affected the recent performance of the BlackRock World Mining Trust? Mm. Well, obviously, it's, uh, we're not immune to those headwinds from the commodity markets. And um, the mining equities, which make up the lion's share of the portfolio, have uh, been under a lot of pressure. Uh, so commodities had a bad month in July. So did mining equities. One of the sharpest sell-offs that we've seen in, um, in recent years. And why has this happened, do you think? Well, I think that people are looking at the, um, the drivers behind the commodity cycle which has been this you know, phenomenal uh, shift of economic power from west to east with the growth of China and to some extent India and those are uh, obviously hugely populous countries where quite small changes in the demand dynamics uh, have a big impact on the world supply demand patterns and uh, that growth in China you know people are looking at the impact of US slowdown on that Chinese growth and they're looking for signs that this is the you know the, the something which is going to impact the longevity of you know the so-called super cycle. When we um, interviewed you for our uh, investment trust awards a few months ago uh, where you won Money Observer's Best Large Trust Award, um, you said that you were a firm believer still in the commodity super cycle. In fact, you thought it still had another 10 years to run or so. Um, given the weakness since then, are you still of that view? Yes, I think so. I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that this broad sweep of history that we're in the middle of you know, is uh, by any means uh, completed. I think that the, the, the pattern of urbanization in, in China and India and the industrial um, uh, growth rates of those countries I think have clearly softened a little bit and, but I, I believe that will be a short term um, uh, effect and I, I don't think that um, the, the, the broad move of economic power in that direction in the world I don't think that's anything like completed yet Following the weakness in, in, in metal prices and commodity prices are you seeing some outstanding value at the moment because obviously we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisition activity as well and so mm. there's a lot of companies obviously seeing value in each other as well. Well Andy I don't think really that uh, I think you, you say that there's a lot of weakness in commodity markets and that's true in some parts of the market uh, but uh, there, are, there are parts of the commodity market where there really isn't that much sign of weakness so if we look at the, uh, the, the what we call the bulk commodities which is things like iron ore uh, uh, metallurgical coal, you know, manganese, uh, the types of a lot of the, the minerals that go into the steel industry, uh, those uh, commodities are at record levels. These are not commodities that always catch the headlines because they are uh, the prices are set by negotiation between the producers and the consumers. Uh, but those are at record levels, and uh, so the companies that you know, we're focusing on in the portfolio are, are some of the, the companies that produce those types of uh, commodities where there's real strength and that strength is uh, ongoing so uh, companies like Rio Tinto, uh, BHP Billiton, uh, uh, what was CVRD now called Valley uh, these are the companies that at the moment form our largest investments mm -hmm. so we think that those the earnings of those companies are going to be really really strong this year and going into next year uh, and so the set the falls in their share prices have created 
you know, a great deal of value. So we're looking at price-earnings ratios on those large companies of uh, well below 10 times earnings. So uh, the trust is um, it's holding its own very nicely, really, over the last year or so. It's still in positive territory, obviously not recording the kind of performance it has over the last sort of um, annual five-year periods, for example. But um, it's standing at a, a, around about 15, 16% discount to net asset value. Mm. Um, so I would imagine that you would say that uh, investors in the trust now would be getting an extra bit of value because they're not only getting um, uh, trust shares on a discount, but you're seeing an awful lot of value in the underlying shares that you're investing in. Well, I couldn't have put it better myself. I think that's uh, exactly how I see it. I think that the discount to assets is uh, something that we've found quite hard to understand. Uh, but that discount is, uh, I find it as personal insult, frankly. <laughs> Could you give an example of um, a company right now which epitomizes everything that you're mm. looking for? The best companies are going to be the ones that have got the most uh, resources the longest life operations are hopefully at the positioning on their cost structure so that they're going to be generating a lot of profits from that demand growth that we see over the next uh, uh, decade. And uh, so we look for long life uh, assets. These are you know, big mines with lots and lots of reserves um, and, uh, and profitable. Uh, so we're looking for cash flow generation uh, we're looking for strategic uh, value and that's at the moment uh, those companies are the large cap companies in this sector and there must be quite a few of these companies which are in South America as well because I know that about 25 percent of your portfolio is actually currently invested in uh, I presume Brazil and companies like Vale that's right Vale is a perfect example it's got excellent assets on a price earnings ratio for next year's earnings of five times. I also know that you can um, invest up to 10% of your portfolio in physical metals and minerals and the such. Um, when did, I mean, does it ever get that high in terms of 10%? And, and how do you gain that exposure to? Well, at the moment, we don't have uh, any uh, exposure to physical metals. And, that, and the reason for that is because uh, we see better value in the equities. Now there can be uh, times when that's not the case. Uh, you, you might, and, and for example, if we were expecting a very short-term spike in a particular commodity, like we saw earlier in the year with platinum, then you would, it would be reasonable to expect that uh, an investment in the physical commodity might do better than an investment in a platinum equity because the platinum equity would not rise to reflect that spike. Interesting to note that with inflation still on the rise um, and the dollar starting to strengthen, uh, gold is also starting to fall now. There are a number of key long-term factors that you need to consider. One is that production of gold from the mines is falling and has been falling since 2001. Now that is not going to change. Uh, it, we're going, we, we expect to see further falls in the future in output. Secondly, central banks. Central banks are not selling as much gold as they did uh, in, recent, uh, in, in recent years. So the supply side is very, very favorable. Uh, but of course, in the current market, uh, where people are following short-term trends, they see the gold price come down a bit from the levels it was earlier in the year, and they jump on that trend. At the moment, gold equities uh, look much, much more attractive than gold bullion does. So in the mining trust, uh, we are at the moment lifting our uh, exposure to gold equities uh, because we think that they've become uh, too cheap relative to gold. Is there anything that um, you can do as an investment trust manager or that your board of directors can do on the investment trust to try and hedge volatility in, in, in the dollar? Well, uh, Andy, we've tried to do that on a few occasions and normally whenever we try to do that we lose money for our investors. So uh, after a few experiments in that direction we've pretty much stopped trying to second guess the currency markets. 
Do you find, obviously, as a closed-end investment trust, you have um, uh, a board of directors? Are they fairly proactive, or do they let you get on with things? Do they sort of say when, for example, you might want to uh, raise gearing? Uh, are you likely to raise gearing in the near future on the trust? Um, we have a very good board at uh, the Mining Trust. It's, uh, our chairman is Tony Lee, who's the, until quite recently, was the CFO at Anglo American. And uh, we have a strong board. They are full of uh, um, opinions and advice, but they don't try and run the fund. With um, things like gearing, uh, they give me guidelines for how much gearing uh, I can take on, uh, and we work with those guidelines. But they don't tell me when to gear. They leave that decision uh, to me. And at the moment, we have taken out some gearing recently. We've uh, drawn down about uh, 30 million pounds of uh, uh, overdraft facility. Uh, we also have uh, some other uh, commitments that would give an equivalent of about 5% gearing right now. Graham Birch, thank you very much for talking to Eyeball. Thank you.